So um, continuing on, the next record, Climax, followed up your your monster uh, success. And um, you had um, I'd Still Say Yes was another hit ballad on that. Um, what do you remember about doing that record? Did you feel a lot of pressure to deliver more hits? Oh, absolutely not. By that time, we were, oh man, we were just, um, we had money in our pocket and our bills were paid and um, we were comfortable. Um, but the, right around that time, the division of the group started to happen. You know, um, everybody was kind of going into their separate groups and camps and a lot of that, uh, um, I think a lot of that, um, I don't, I, I, yeah, there was a, a, a division of um, of people kind of going their separate ways. So I, uh, I am, um, I think a lot of the problems, I mean, if you really were to get down to it was, you know, I had become very, very popular. And, you know, when you have a group of girls who are equally putting in the work and you have one person, um, people gravitating more to one individual, which was me, you know, I'm not trying to be vain about it. I'm just being real about what was happening. Um, um, it became a division within the group. It, you know, people kind of started, um, you know, forming in little groups anyway. We started recording separately. Like I went into the studio and um, I did I did uh, Sexy. I did uh, Divas Need Love too. I did, um, what other song did I do? Uh, I think there were three or four songs that I did on my own. And then Joyce went in and she did, I still say yes. You know, we were kind of breaking up. And then Marcy went in and she did a couple songs, you know. And then we would come together in a meeting and then they would play all the songs. And then Dick Griffey would decide which song was going to go on the album. So um, there wasn't a lot of pressure. But the, that's when the division of the group starts, which happens. It's not just climax. Stuff happens with all groups, you know. Um, and um, um, th th there was no pressure. Actually, it was. I think that album was a brilliant album. All together with all those songs, you know, I think it was a great album, but we, we didn't stay together long enough to really promote it. I want to go through real quick and say a few things about specific tracks on this album. Uh, okay. So the, overall, this album was uh, a little mellower and more ballads than the previous one. Um, but Sexy, you had George Clinton involved there. Um, how did that happen? And what was that like uh, working with him? You know, let me say that um, we were probably more ballads because everybody was chasing that I miss you. Everybody wanted another I miss you. You know, and when I say everybody, you know, I know Joyce was trying to, to make that happen because that was something that kind of pushed her to the forefront. And then Mogby, you know, she wrote it, you know, so she probably was just delivering what she does. She's a great writer, you know. Um, um, and um, with Sexy, I was in the studio and um, George Clinton was recording in the studio next to me. And he would pop his head in and listen. And he would go, can I come in and listen? I go, can you come in and listen? Of course you can come in and listen. So he would come into the, my studio, and I would be in there with my uh, engineer, Jerry Brown. And um, um, he, the next day, we were in the studio mixing. I think we were mixing or recording. I can't remember what. And he... Can I come into the studio? Of course you can. <laughs> so he would come into the studio and then he said one day, can I write something on this? And I'm like, uh, yes, you can, you know, without a doubt. So he wrote some of the first verse. He did, and when, you know, when I pose on my clothes, you know, he, he did the whole, most of the first verse. And um, we kept that. And that's how he, that's how he became a part of that particular song, and um, he and I became really good friends. 
afterwards and we would hang out together. He was very much a gentleman. You know, he would, whenever he came into town, he'd call me up. I'd go to his hotel and we would go eat and have a great time, you know. And um, that's how that came about. Was that your first time meeting George? Yes, it was when he when he came into the studio. Uh -huh. That was my first time meeting him. Yeah, yeah, I've had the pleasure of spending some time with him too. He's just a really great, fun guy to be with. He, he, he's a great guy, and he's he's a he's a gentleman. I mean, you know, all the time we spent a lot of time together, and uh, I we would just I would just he would just. You know, hey, B, I'm in town. Come by. And I go to his hotel room where we just sit and talk. You know, he was always a gentleman. We would just talk about things and laugh and have a good time, you know. And, um, you know, I like Joyce. I love Joyce a lot. And when you talk about girl groups, of course, he was behind Brides of Funkenstein and Parlette. And so he was helping push that out, too. Oh, yes. And he would call me and he would come to my sessions and... He would listen to my songs and he would hear a lot of them. Uh, one in particular, she's just a pretty face. He, can I record that? Can I record that? You know, and, I mean, we, you know, we had, we formed a great friendship from, uh, from Sexy, from the song Sexy, you know, him being a part of that song. El elsewhere on this album, um, Fab Attack to me seemed kind of like a, um, uh, meeting in the ladies' room, and I'll pause. Kind of follow-up type track. Um. Well, Fabricate was was um, a song that Joyce Irby was working on, and she asked me to come in. As I said, we started kind of like dividing up and recording separately during this time, and she asked me to come in to do some of the vocals on it. And um, um, to be honest with you, I didn't really particularly like the track that much. I, I tried to do my best. I don't, I don't really believe that it was my best work. But, um, you know, and, and nor is it my favorite song, you know. Um, and I think that um, she ended up, because I could not do my best work, I think she had somebody else come in and do some work on it. So I really don't, I don't really have a lot of um, memories of that song. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was it was good, but not innovative like you know those other tracks were. Yeah, it wasn't innovative, and you know, I tried, but it was it, it didn't it did not inspire me. You know, the, I think I I think I did write the I gave it the title, Fab Attack. I gave it the title, but I just couldn't. I, I didn't really feel it as much as the other song. The uh, ballad Divas Need Love Too strikes me as a sort of a climax a version of Gigolos Get Lonely Too. Again, another time uh, tie-in. Tie is, is there any relationship there, or did I just read that into it? Well, it's not a ballad, I mean, but it's more of a mid-tempo. Yeah. Um, definitely, I would say that it was an answer. I think it was an answer to it. I'm trying to figure out where I was in that moment in time when I wrote it. I think I was writing an answer, you know, to, um, of course, it doesn't sound uh, like a copy. It sounds like an answer, yeah. you know. So, um, um, yeah, I um, I came up with the song. I wrote the, uh, the keyboard part, and I went to Vincent Brantley, and I said, you know, help me out with this. And I went over to his house, and actually, uh, we had the same attorney who said, you guys need to get together and write some stuff. So I, I took him what I had, and I said, this song is called, it's going to be called Jesus Me Love Too. And um, it wasn't spoken like, this is the answer to, she didn't know, you know, no one said that. It's just, this song is going to be Jesus Me Love Too. He listened to it. We played around. I was at his house. We played around with the song for a little while. And then he says, okay, okay, I got it, I got it. And I left, and when I came back, he had written the track. It was awesome. <laughs> it was awesome. And then I finished all the lyrics on the song, and um, that song right there was a great song. Yeah, it's a highlight. Um, third I, had a lot of, I had a lot of divas, I mean, real, <laughs> like, singing divas, call me up and go, oh, my God, 
you know, uh, get us a holiday. A lot of women would call me up and go, I love that. Can you write me something like that? You know who called me up during that time and asked me um, to write something? I love with Sylvester. Oh, wow. <laughs> Listen, Sylvester called me up. I got the record company says, Sylvester wants your telephone number. I go, oh, give it to him. You know, so Sylvester called me, he goes, oh my God, I love that song. He goes, I want you to work on my next album. I said, without a doubt, you know, should I come to you or should you come to me? Because I wanted Sylvester, I was going to really lay that album out. And then two weeks later, he passed away. Uh, well. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a very bittersweet story, but at least you've had that connection yes and it could have you know what now that i think about it it could have been during the i look good song too i can't remember but i'm between it was it was i remember him talking about that song in our conversation but yeah he passed away i was gonna i was gonna work on sylvester's next album can you imagine that that would have been something special <laughs> that would have been great yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and you talked about sort of this record being a little disconnected because you guys were, you know, kind of fracturing a little bit. And I think that's really, yeah. really evident on some of these tracks like Danger Zone, which is like pop rock, and Man Size Love, which is sort of a Denise Williams kind of like song written by Rod Temperton. So, I mean, a lot of, yeah, Rod, a lot of this stuff was all over the map, kind of. Well, I, I believe it was probably all over the map because we started getting pulled in a lot of directions. Okay, you know, uh, everyone's equal in poverty, you know, and nobody really kind of like was coming for us. But as soon as we became wealthy with music and songs and hits, everyone wanted to record with us. Um, um, what's the cup of Carol Bear, Sager, you know, and um, what's your partner's name? Oh my God. Uh, with Care Bear, Sager's husband's name, Bert Bacharach, you know, and we went, Joyce and I, I remember we went and hung out at their house, which was the biggest house I've ever seen in Beverly Hills. And, um, you know, and then Rod Temperton wanted to do a song with us, and, you know, everybody started pulling us in a lot of directions. So you probably heard a lot of different, I mean, who can turn down a song for Rod Temperton? Who can turn down a song from Carol Bear Sager and Bert Bacharach? So we had all these different influences. That's what you started to hear. You know, no more the little young girls from Compton High and Fayetteville, North Carolina, and the hood. Now we were like hanging with the big boys, you know? So we were able to, with what you heard was um, just a cornucopia. Uh, of different sounds because everybody was wanted to, to be involved with us. Man Side Love was a great song. It should have been a huge hit. That was a, actually a soundtrack for a movie. Yeah, it's really catchy uh, pop R&B kind of track. <clears throat> yeah, that should have been a number one pop song, I think. That was a huge. And Lorena's vocals were great. I mean, I remember Rod Temperton. And I speak of, of him fondly because he was the, he was great. He you know we were in the studio and he was uh, he wanted you know he wanted to uh, uh, you know Joyce Irby came in. He wanted to kind of figure out which vocals he wanted to use. Joyce Irby came in. He didn't want to use her vocals. And then Lorena came in. He was like, yeah, I want her. I want her voice on this track. So that's you know so many great stories behind the stories. I think um, "Long Distance Love Affair." When I when I hear that vocal, I think Michael Jackson. I don't know if that's just me. It probably so. And then once again, we were all chasing that. We were all chasing that rock. We were all chasing that "I Miss You." You know, everybody wanted to do a. Everybody wanted another hit like "I Miss You." "I Miss You" was a huge hit. I mean, even time. Any time you can go into the elevator. Uh, and go on your way to your doctor's office, and you hear, uh, I 
I miss you. Or anytime you're shopping in your favorite grocery store and you hear I miss you, any song you hear in a grocery store is a huge hit. So I miss you did very well for Climax and it was written by um, the great composer Lynn Mosby. You know, she's not a fan of writing much. It wasn't quantity for her, it was quality. And she wrote that song and it was beautiful. It, it was, it's part of our legacy. Well, and I'd still say yes became like a wedding staple too. Yeah, I think that Joyce should, she should um, go to all the wedding places and put herself up to sing that because she would get a lot of work out of just singing that one song because people, people, uh, that's a great, it was great, it was a great song. It was written by Babyface. Oh, that's right, yeah. So you uh, parted ways with the group shortly after that. Um, I know you um, yeah. You did Madam X around that time. Um, can you tell us yeah. like, kind of what transpired and, and how you became involved with Madam X? I left the group because there was a lot of uh, uh, dysfunction and a lot of, um, uh, uh, um, I just wasn't comfortable. And you know, um, it's like being in a relationship, you know, and, and with, with, you know, let's say your wife or your husband and things are not going right and you have to make a decision, uh, do I stay or do I, I just kind of like, you know, things are, are popping off and should I just try to make a life of my own and I had to move forward because I was unhappy. It had nothing to do with, oh, I'm better. I, it had a lot to do with I was unhappy being where I was because I like peace and, and I like um, I like unity. And we were just torn apart. And the vision that I had of the group in the you know in the beginning, we changed. It changed. The vision changed. And you know, success comes when you have a group of people and everybody's kind of sharing the same vision. And um, I, I think before Joyce Irby came into the group. Uh, we had a, a vision, and then once she came in, the vision starts to change a little bit. And I'm not saying that's negative. I'm not saying that she did anything wrong. It just started to change because you had a different um, a, opinion of the way the group should look, the sound, how we, which, how we should be, and a lot of uh, separation and all of that uh, within the entire group. And it had nothing to do with anything but stuff just happened. You know, people want to know what happened. It just, it just wasn't any fun any longer. You know, I'll be like, well, Magic Johnson said that when he left the Lakers. When it ain't fun no more, I had to go. And it, was, it became not fun for me anymore. You know, so, and then we can break it down and try to, oh, he did this or she did this. or You know, but the bottom line was it's just, you know, it was just time to, to do something else. Um, everything has a little bit of an expiration date. So when I decided to leave, you know, uh, we tried to work it out, like every relationship, but I, it just didn't work out. And um, I left, and um, it was actually, in a way, it was just perfect timing because the group was still hot, and um, I had a lot of opportunities that came uh, came because of the success of Climax. And I was like, I wanted to evolve more as a producer, you know. And, and then the understanding of, I never wanted to be a producer. It was Dick Griffey said, here's $2,500, go produce this song. And, you know, when you're struggling, that was a lot of money. And that was in the beginning of, uh, uh, of me, you know, I gave him a song. He says, no, you can produce this yourself. And he gave me a little bit of money that was just kind of an advance to go do it. And then when I started to produce, I realized how much I liked it. So I started producing and uh, one day I got a call from Sylvia Rohn and she said, what are you doing? I heard you're not with the group anymore. And I go, I am getting ready to produce and I'm gonna put together a group, a group of girls. And once again, there was a void. You know, I'm always into trying to fill the void of what's going on and trying to, be a visionary and see around the corners, you know? And um, I said, I'm gonna to put together a three girl group. And she says, I wanna be a part of that. I'm gonna come out and meet with you and we'll discuss it. And then when she came out, 
we uh, we did a handshake, and um, and she gave me a record deal, and I created Madam Max. Well, they immediately got my attention with the just my uh, just that type of girl single out of the gate. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, that was a good album. That was a good album. That was um, that was me kind of you know, no one telling me what I had to do. Just that was just me having fun with my producer. I mean, I'm sorry, with my engineer Jerry Brown, um, and being able to bring in the best musicians, the Colino DeCosto, the Waters, doing background. I just had it was a great concept, but. I think the problem with Madam Max was, uh, um, once again, when you deal with women, everybody has, you know, it, it's women don't really like women telling them what to do. That's the bottom line. And so, yeah, they, yeah, they, you know, I wouldn't individually found each of these girls and created a group with them. And, um, uh, um, you know, it didn't really last as long as it should have. Yeah, I mean, it there was, was... There was there was nothing done. Nobody, you know, there shouldn't have not be any any um, horror stories other than the fact that it didn't last. It, it was funky. It was sexy. It was seductive. Um, and you had uh, Amp Fiddler on there, too, I noticed. Oh, Amp was my guy, yeah. Amp, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And was so funky during those days. And look, look, you know, I'm going to say this because nobody else is going to say this. And if you talk to them, they'll tell you. But I put a lot of guys on in the beginning. I put Rob Bacon on. I put Ann Fiddler on. I put, um, I found, um, uh, what's his name? Oh, God, I'm having, um, I need to eat. Um, What's his name, the little white guy who sings? Oh my gosh, can't think of his name. It'll come to me in a second. But I put a lot of I put a lot of these guys on. What's the guy who was signed to Yab Yam? Um is he on this record? No, he's not on this record. Oh. I'm just giving myself a little props right now. But I found him. Um oh God, I can't think of his name at the moment. Um, he was on Yab Yum. He was like gonna be the white baby face. Mm. You know what I'm talking about? Not sure. If it comes to you. Uh, oh, all right. Let's move on. Yeah. But yeah, I am. Um, yeah, I. Ann Fiddler was just so funky. He was. He was always hanging out. He spent the night at my house many times. You know, we we had a a great friendship and. Um, and um, he was so funky and so good to see what he's doing now. He found he always was so odd and so different, and he found his place, you know, in music. Yeah, he does sort of like uh, avant-garde funk, is what I would call it. Yes. Um, so this record, though, especially though, I felt like there was a significant amount of uh, pr Prince type influence. Um, did, did you feel that that way, or? Listen, Prince affected everybody. You know, of course. <laughs> you know, I. You know, Prince. Prince. Ex Prince. Hold on for a second. Go. Go down. Go. See you. Go outside. See you later. It's my doggy. Um. Prince affected everybody. I mean, anytime you had a bunch of men putting beating their faces. You know, everybody had, every musician wanted to be Prince. As far as I was concerned, I wasn't patterning myself, patterning myself after Prince, but naturally his influence was all over everything that I did. You can't, because you know why? Prince represented freedom. You know, free sexuality. He, he, he represented freedom in um, the look the sound, everything. And once, if you're a creative person, you're naturally gravitated towards him. So everything you did is like, wow, wow, Prince can get away with this. I'm going to try to get away with this. You know, so definitely he had an inspiration on me. I particularly sense it in tracks like I'm Weak for You and I Want Your Body. 
more more of I want your body. Um, I mean, if if I were to think back and go, did I feel Prince and I'm weak for you? No, but I definitely felt the vibe of Prince and um um the other song. I want, I want your, your body. body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you made these tracks nice and long too, so the d dance floor was no problem. <laughs> well, back in those days, it was all right to write a six-minute song, <laughs> you know, seven minutes or whatever. That's what you did, you know. And you know, you know, and all, a lot of that once again with the with the Prince inspiration. It came from Prince, you know. You know, Prince would do a song, and the next thing you do, he next thing you know, he would do a break, and then he'd go off and do another. You know, so everybody was trying to copy, or oh, not so much copy, but we, but we realized that we, uh, we could do that. Prince made it possible that we can, oh, I can start this song and then take a break, and then I'm gonna come back and I'm just gonna breathe through the whole second verse. You know, Prince made you know that it was possible. How, how would you describe your uh, your approach as a producer? How do you think uh, maybe somebody that worked with you would have described what you were like to work with as a producer? Very meticulous. Um, not so much in everything had to be perfect with me. You know, I really went off a vibe. And if you made a mistake and if the mistake was good, I would probably keep it, you know. Um, you know who's a, a great person to talk to? Jerry Brown. We spent so much time. We, we, we're like married. You know, we spent so much time in the studio. He probably can answer that question better. But um, I was very free. I really didn't have any rules. You know, I, I've been in studios with people who are very mean or very uh, structured or very by the rule, A, B, C, D, E. I didn't really have any of those. I just kind of like, okay, this is what we're going to do. And um, if anybody came in with an idea that was better than mine, I didn't have a problem with adding it. So... Madam X, uh, unfortunately, only lasted for one record. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you came back in 19, yeah. 1990 with basically your uh, solo debut, right? Yeah, yeah. That was fun. Once again, you know, I was allowed to uh, do whatever the heck I wanted to do. Lou and Silas signed me at MTA. I think I was one of his... Uh, first acts under his label and he just let me do what I wanted to do and um, that's the result of it um, drama according to Bernadette Cooper and during that time I had developed a great friendship with Tina Marie you know we were really we had become um, just so mates in the sense of creation and friendship, you know, and um, we spent a little time together, not a lot, but we spent time together. She would come by my house and smoke a joint and we talk about things. She was very, very, she was a wonderful person. She was very spiritual and very knowledgeable. And we used to just talk for hours and hours, you know, and um, one day she called me and she, you know, I want to be, I want to do something with you musically. And I said, well, I want to do something with you. So we, she, she kind of uh, was on one of my tracks and I was on one of hers. You know, and I'm finding it difficult these days. You cannot call up an, another person and just say, hey, I'm in the studio, come on by. And they come on by and put their vocals down. It's a lot of paperwork, talk to my manager. The, the creativity is gone. I just reached out to a couple couple people, I won't say their name, and it's just people, women have another agenda on, on how they want to do things, you know, and it's unfortunate because I'm still old school in the sense of um, let's just get in the studio and make some things happen, and if it happens, it benefits us all, you know. Yeah, that's But Tina was my girl, yeah. And she was inspirational. Um, um, she she inspired me 
to do a lot of things that are on that particular album, on the drama according to Bernadette Cooper album. I'm such a huge Tina Tina fan. She's um, her and probably Shaka Khan, my two favorite uh, female singers, but also Tina because she did everything, you know, and uh, she was uh, quite a talent. Yes, Tina, oh my God. And she was an amazing, uh, she, I, I, don't, I hate to say was, because her spirit it still lives on. She is an amazing, amazing individual, you know, and she had, you know, it's just a, she had great style and she was understated. She was the kind of person who, you know, she wasn't flashy a dresser, but the pants that she would wear were $3,500, you know? And I would look at her and I would go, wow, just look at the quality on those, you know, and she would laugh at me, but she had amazing style and she had an amazing presence. Well, let me just say, Bernadette, that this record to me was a, a tour de force. Um, great, great record. Uh, packed. It's packed with fantastic funk, and um, but also modern touches of that period, you know? Um, yes. Great beats and attitude throughout the whole record. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I can't say why it didn't sell more than it did. I think it, it should have. But anyone who's listening or watching, if you haven't checked out the drama according to Bernadette Cooper, you have to do it as soon as this interview's over. <laughs> well, you know, to give you a backstory, because everything, you know, has a backstory, and I have so many amazing stories, and i got to write a book about it one day. But, uh, which I am writing right now. Well, I'm not writing that story, but I'm writing novels, but that's another, that's another subject. But um, the backside to that was, the backstory to that was, um, uh, MCA didn't know what to do with me. Because if you want to listen to that particular album, it's not your typical R&B album. Then they turned me into an alternative. They moved me to the alternative department. And then I had, what really hurt me, uh, was the president of the company at that time, which I won't say his name, told me he didn't believe in videos. Quote, unquote, I don't believe in videos. So we're not, I'm, you know, I, I, we're not doing videos. on. I don't think any of the artists under his watch did many videos. So I was like, you don't believe in videos. Okay, I didn't believe in, that was when MTV had become popular. He didn't really want to go towards that. And it was also during the time when music was changing. No more bands. It was hip hop. It was Belle Biv DeVoe. I got caught up in that. Uh, Louis Silas. Louis Silas told me, you know, we when when I was released from the company, he came and he, he met me for dinner and he discussed it with me. Uh, and you know, and told me the reason why the company was letting me go because things were changing. And um, you know, that's what it was, you know, and um, it did what it was supposed to do. You know, I'm not going to, whatever that is, it did what it was supposed to do. The universe has a way of doing what it's supposed to do, you know, so I'm, I, I'm happy I had the opportunity. Well, it's a work of uh, great achievement you should be very proud of. I am very proud of it. And Bette Midler, she took one of the songs off of it. And it, I don't know if you've seen her show, um, Divas Las Vegas, but she opens her show with I Look Good. Uh, she does her version of the song. And I knew she was doing it. They called me and you know, I went and met her and hung out with her and all of that. And, um, uh, you know, uh, I think a lot of these things, when I'm, when I'm gone, long gone, the music will live on, and that's good enough for me. You also had uh, Chucky Booker on the record. Oh, listen, I had Lenny Kravitz, I had Chucky Booker, I had Polino De Costa. I had the, I had so many people on that album. You know, Lenny Kravitz. See, um, that was during the time when he um he saw you know what song? Let's be discreet about it. That's Lenny on the guitar. Let's be discreet about it. But it was during the time when he had just gotten a deal 
just got a deal, right? Like after he did that song, he got a record deal. He apparently, for whatever reason, he, he didn't want me to put his credit down. But um, I didn't question it. I just said, okay, cool. You know, as long as I can keep the guitar part, you know. But um, that's Lenny. And um, a lot of great people were on that project. Well, well, now when I listen, Chucky Booker, you know, Chucky Booker was um, my, you know, we we grew up in church together, and he was younger than me, and he used to have this major crush on me. He was a little you know, young boy who was just, you know, had a little crush on me. I played drums, and he played. His mother, Celestine Booker, was the keyboard player at the church. His mother is major. His mother is one of the best writers and keyboard players and so that's where he gets it from but i've been knowing chucky booker since i was 12 years old 13 years old <laughs> well interestingly enough uh, by coincidence or design i don't know but climax the the, the existing uh, lineup of climax at that time came back with a record the max is back the same year um, as your yeah. debut. Um, was that just a coincidence that it was the same year? Yeah, that was a coincidence. Did, did you have any... I, I don't know much about... I don't know much about it because I was gone. And um, I believe they have one of my songs on that album um, that I agreed to uh, let them use. But I was kind of like in my own zone. <clears throat> but there wasn't any hate or no dysfunction <clears throat> at that point. I mean, you know, the drama had ended, and uh, Lorena and I have always remained good friends. Lorena and I have always been very close to lead singer of the group. We never even had an argument ever, ever, ever. So we were always in communication, even when I left the group. So I think she wanted to do the song, and she called me and said, can we? I said, no problem. But I don't know much about the record uh, because I was in my own zone. But I do believe that they, they did well with one of the songs. Yeah, they did okay with one of the songs. But, I mean, overall, from my standpoint, you, you, cr you crushed that record. Um, a few years later, though, in 94, they came out with another record that has uh, the old the old dog in you on it that you were involved with? Oh, that was Joyce. Joyce was trying to do her version of whatever climax. And um, she wanted me to, uh, she asked me to do some, something over it, and I did. Was that your only involvement in that record? Yes. Um, okay. The, the, beat, the beat of that song reminded me a little bit of Soul to Soul, if you remember them. Yeah, was it? No, that was on the um, the Soul to Soul sound. That was on um, Good Love, right? That was when Lorena, and it was Lorena Lynn and Cheryl Cooley. Uh, that was Good Love, I believe. Well, there, there was that one, but also I felt some of that on the uh, that later record, too. You know, that's possible. That's, it's all a blur. <laughs> it's possible. So, <laughs> so much, so, you know. So what else did you keep busy with uh, during, the, during the 90s, and when did you get involved in, you know, performing some of the Climax material and that kind of thing? Well, you know, um, during that time when, when hip hop kind of took over and the Belle Bill of DeVoe and the rap started to come, you know, it was a little period in time where I, I got lost. I didn't know musically where to go. So being in it, you know, one of the things that Dick Griffey taught me, you know, Dick Griffey, first of all, let me say this about Dick Griffey. Let me give homage to Mr. Griffey. I love Mr. Griffey. You know, without him, uh, the president of Solar Records, I would not have ever entered the music industry. I would not be a producer. I would not be a writer. I would not be an entertainer. He's the one who saw, who, who envisioned all of those within me before I even realized it myself. You know, and, and he, uh, he and I formed a great friendship 
and he would we we spend time, you know, going out having dinner together and talking. And he was he was very inspirational in my career. And I must say that um, um, you know he's passed away. And the day before he passed away, you know, I was able to go visit him uh, and express my thanks because what he gave us as all of us, all the solar artists was invaluable. He, I mean, we, we could not, and people always say, oh, he did this, he did that. Listen, if you go to uh, a, a, um, a university and you study to become a doctor, that's a high price to pay. And he taught us, and what he gave us was the ability to continue to make a living for the rest of our lives. The Howard Hills, the um, the lakesides, the uh, you know, without what he created for us, we would not be able to go out and make a living. I mean, I go out and I can perform and I can make uh, you know a pretty decent amount of money that can sustain me. So during that time, though, I was lost. You know, when 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 I say lost, just it's, it's musically, I wasn't inspired to do much. So he taught me to be in this business, but don't be of it. You know, it's one of the things that you're blessed to do, but you don't have to, you know, be mean to people. You don't have to think that that's only the thing you can do in life. So he says, you go out and you experience many things that you're capable of doing. And being a creator, I'm capable of creating anything, you know. Uh, so I, I, I said, you know, uh, I want to do something different. And that's when I opened up a store. I moved to the East Coast and I opened up a clothing store and it did very, very well. And I ended up coming back into LA when my mother got sick because I had to take care of her. And I sold the company and um, then I slowly started to get back into music. And that was with touring. And during the time that I was um, at my clothing store, that's when the television show knocked on my door and song. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then they knocked on my door one day with the, with the camera crew, and that is the reason why I even came back into music, because they were like, we want to put Climax back together, that I got. That was the first time I'd seen the girls in so long, and we decided to tour again. At that time, that was that, that is the thing that kind of turned me around and got me back into music and, you know, and said, you know, there's a legacy that we created and the legacy that Mr. Griffey allowed us to create, you know, and there's a market for it and people want to hear the old songs and that's when I started back to art. So I want, now, I, now, I want to say now I got it. Huh? I, I just wanted to say for the viewers, I think that was around 2009 you did that on Sunday? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then, um, Bands Re... No, that was... You know what? That wasn't on Sunday. I'm sorry. It was Bands Reunited first. Bands, a show called Bands Reunited came first. They're the ones who knocked on my door. And then after Bands Reunited was on song. Okay. Yeah. And then that's what that's kind of uh, how I got back into doing it. So from that point, you know how how to what extent have you toured? And there's been a couple of different versions of of climax touring, right? Yep. Um, I, I've been back on the road. We first started off as a group, the entire group except Rob and Cryer. Robert Grider was going through some personal issues. So when Bands Reunited came, and they gave us an opportunity to go back on the road, it was all of us. And then, you know, Lynn Maltry really didn't want to do it any longer. And um, uh, we we went out on the road for a while. And that was during the time when we found out that Cheryl Cooley was trying to trademark the name behind our back and use it and create our, her own thing. 
So that's what the whole unsung on the um, Bands Reunited show was centered around, the, all that drama. So, yes, yeah, there's a lot of, with the Truth and Lending Act, are you familiar with the Truth and Lending Act? Well, I don't know it verbatim, but it relates to the trademarking of the name, I'm guessing. Well, the Truth and Lending Act is a, is a new a new act that has that that is in effect that states um, it's a law that states if you are a member of a popular group, you can individually go out and make a living using the name. So we went through the whole trademark drama, and pretty much the trademark result was we can use the name individually, but in order to keep um, people from being confused, we have to use our name, like Climax featuring Bernadette Cooper, Climax featuring Joyce Irby, Climax featuring Cheryl Cooley, Climax featuring Marina uh, Stewart. So it has to be that tagline behind it. And because we have our differences, you have the different versions out there. It would be wonderful if we could all get together and do it, but um, uh, it, it, it's not it's not happening like that. So, and such as I mean, we're not the only group who has issues. Oh, I There's know that. That's groups. for sure. <laughs> yeah. So that uh, people, I wish you guys would get back together. No, you don't. You think you do, <laughs> but it's much better probably this way. Um, I say that because. Um, Everybody is, uh, has a, a way that they want to present themselves, you know, and I'm more, uh, I have a different vision. And if you come to see my show, it's different. If you go see whoever else's show, it's a whole different show. You know, I'm, I'm more, um, yeah, so that's that. Well, Climax, in this regard, uh, Bernadette, is more the rule than the exception because you know i've interviewed so many bands and so many of them continue to perform but they're fractured in different sort of clicks um so it's it's really it's really common but it's confusing to the marketplace it's confusing to the marketplace you know and uh you know i get a lot of that and um but you know what can you do you know, um, I I hope and you know a lot of times, and I've had this issue, even with the trademark issue, and even with the truth of lending that states, you know, it has to you have to clearly state what climax it is. The promoters fail to use it. The next thing you know, you see the ad, and it's just climax. You know, because they don't want to go through the, they don't want to, they just want people to show up when they, you know. Maybe if a person knew it was another version, they may not show up. So, whatever. It's, it's very, um, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Absolutely. There's a lot of stuff going out there with everybody from war to the Commodores to, you know, uh, Lakeside. And <laughs> Scott, it's like a marriage. You know, people go, uh, you guys should get back together. Would you get back with your ex wife? <laughs> Would you get back with your ex husband? No, because there are some differences that you have that you just can't work it out. It just ha stuff happens sometimes. But listen, there's no hate. I say whatever version is out there, go see it because you're still hearing the music. Well, and so you came back uh, or went back into the studio and came out with uh, Last Eve on Earth, episode one. Planet Sexy. Yes. Uh, that was just a yes. couple of years ago. So, how did that one come together? Um, you know, Last Evil on Earth um, it was never, I put it out, but my vision, um, it, it was, I always think Last Evil on Earth is going to hit one day. I never thought it was going to be like an immediate hit or whatever. Actually, Last Evil on Earth is a soundtrack because I'm writing novels and I'm doing audio books now. And Last Evil on Earth is the uh, soundtrack to one of my books that you'll soon hear. So 
I put it out there to put it out there, but I never really promoted it. I just kind of put it out there because I knew it had, I had intentions for it. And you'll probably hear that sooner than later with the audio books that I'm doing. I'm doing um, um, some great books. Well, this music is impressive too. I think um, there's a little more electronic um, oriented music. Um, yes. Yeah. So how, how have you been inspired by electronic music? I love like, electronic music. I love, um, <clears throat> I love club music. I, you know, probably, probably be going more into that direction. Probably I just got a, um, a deal that I'm working on and we'll discuss later when we we'll come back for the next interview. But um, house music, club music, all of that kind of stuff like that. Um, um, I, I love it all. I can't really just say that's what I want to do. That's what I like. I love all kind of music. I love jazz. I love country. I love all kind of music. So that's probably the ride that I was in at the moment. And the next project will probably be a completely different vibe. <laughs> so I know you do. You you are working on a new project. I understand. Uh, when when might people hear some new music? Uh, 2020. I'm working on something that's really, really great, but I can't really discuss it now. But I will, you know, come back and talk to you about it, um, you know, at any time after the project is released. But I'm working on it. And a lot of it is is connected to my audio books. So uh, this particular thing, though, it's it's it stands alone. Even though it's connected to the audio books, it still stands alone as a as an album or a project. So when it comes out or near to it, we'll we'll be in touch and I'll let you know what's going on. Excellent. I look forward to that. And uh, you. you've mentioned a few times now, so can you just kind of encapsulate in a nutshell what your what your writing um, interests are and and what kind of writing are you doing? series of books, um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's not autobiographies or nothing like that. They're, they're novels about life and, and um, things that, uh, you know, very geared towards women and the things that women go through. And, you know, a lot of it is, you know, one, one thing is a science fiction thing I just did. It's just different. It's not about my past or this person's past. One of the books is, it's called A Cry No One Heard, and it's like the backstory of climax that nobody knows about. It's a great book that's coming out. Um, but um, it, it, the books are all great. I don't, you know, it's not much I can say about them, but I think you'll be hearing about them soon. Excellent. Um, so before um, I give all that information of how people can follow everything you're doing, I have a final question for you, and that is, sure. as you look back on it all, what what work or accomplishment are you most proud of and why? Um, musically or in life? Musically. Let's start there. Creating the band called Climax. And not only creating the band called Climax, um, being inspirational in a lot of people's lives and helping them to achieve their dreams. And I think that um, if you were to look on the album that I have, I, I have um, part of my mission is to help people to achieve things. And in doing that, I really have no expectations. But when I go back and look at those things, I think that um, that um, supersedes all maybe the bad things I've done in my life or the negative thing is the fact that I really enjoy helping people to achieve their dreams, you know, uh, and, I, and I really don't want, I, the respect is the only thing that I expect, you know, from that. And as far as life accomplishments, um, you know, 
as corny as this may sound, my biggest accomplishment is, is, is taking care of um, my mother and my grandmother. Really, you know, my uh, welcome sacrifice, you know, I, you know, I, I saw my grandmother to the end and now I'm, I'm doing that with my mom. So, you know, as a woman and many women out there, solo, taking care of being the breadwinners and taking care of their families and taking care of their mothers and their grandmothers and their great great grandmothers. I'm just like them, you know. And that would be my one of my biggest accomplishments because I'm very into uh, there would be no life without them. So as uh, you know, and there would be no Bernadette Cooper and there would be no climax. Uh, without these individuals, so those that's my biggest accomplishment. Well, that makes total sense to me. Um, <laughs> that's uh, that's keeping it real for sure. Yeah, that's keeping well. That's keeping it real because you know there there are many sides, to, you know there are many sides, but just not just music. And you know, I want people to know I'm just like you. I'm just like you. I'm out here doing my thing. And, you know, trying to be fly until I die. That's it. <laughs> so, excellent, Bernadette. How can uh, people keep track of everything you're doing musically, uh, books, whatever? Oh, gosh. Um, let me see how can I. Um, ClimaxOfficial.com. Um, ClimaxBernadetteCooper.com. And of course, on Facebook, there's Climax featuring Bernadette Cooper, and there's also Bernadette Cooper. Um, Instagram, Bernadette Cooper, Climax. There's so much stuff. I should have had this all written down. Uh, you know, I'm pretty much available. If you just Google my name, a lot of things will pop up. There you go. All right. And as far as the, book, as <laughs> the books are con is concerned, I don't. I don't have it in front of me, but um, if you go to, uh, um, God, what's the name of it? Just hit me up on my uh, Facebook page and I, and I can direct you to all, all these different sites. I got so many of them. Fantastic. Well, um, it's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you for taking the time to do so and sharing these stories about your life and music and Wish you continued success in whatever projects you pursue. Thank you. This has been a wonderful therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, do I want to do this? I don't know. But as soon as you get it from the mic, you sell everything, you know, right? Yeah. Well, you know what? Um, right. People, people love you, and they love the uh, music you've you've given them. So, um, much credit to you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. And as I said before, when we get closer to the time of releasing the other projects, we'll keep in touch. And anytime you want to talk again, just give me a buzz. Absolutely. Yeah. Please keep me uh, apprised of what's going on. I will. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye bye. All right. Bye, everybody. Hey, hey, back at the Truth and Rhythm Mothership. So, what do you, do you think of Miss Cooley? I enjoyed her a lot, and it cracked me up when she likened it to being a therapy session. I think it ends up being like that for a lot of Truth and Rhythm episodes as the show seeks to dig well under the surface of its guests and their music. That along with a dedicated focus on funk, R&B, and jazz plays large in making this program unlike any other. The therapy angle gives a whole new meaning to my Dr. GX moniker but, you know, something viewers and listeners are unlikely to know is that my college degree in radio, TV, and film also included a minor in psychology. So there's uh, some food for thought to chew on and think about. In any case, a big thanks once again out to this episode's special guest, Miss Bernadette Cooper, founder of the legendary Climax. Also, as always, a big thank you out to you, the viewers. Thank you so much for your continued interest and support. You keep gaining momentum, and it's a beautiful thing. Speaking of which, before you uh, be sure you subscribe. If you haven't already done so, subscribe 
to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives, breathes, and thrives. Uh, show these funk, R&B, and jazz artists that you love their work, how important it is to you in your lifetime, and show support for the show that does this just for you, the fans, for free. How can you beat that? You can't, so subscribe and get as many people to as you can. Also, write me at scottg at funkinstuff.net. would love to hear from you. I'd like to hear what you think of the show, who else you want to see, and just to talk music, you know. We're all music lovers here, so let's get that dialogue going. I promise you, you'll hear back from me quickly. With that, as always, this is Scott Dr. Jigs, we'll find signing off, saying, you know it, right? Keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.